Hello, this is Faith of Faith and Books, and I am out at a, I couldn't go to the park I went to before because they closed it. I think because they're putting, I mean, they put gates across the parking lot. I think because they're putting up lights, because they always have a winter show, um, a, a festival of lights or whatever that we often go to. We don't go to it every year, but um, anyway, so I think that's why they're, they've they closed the parking lot. But I'm just going to... Um, do a little bit about Robert Browning because he's the poet for Victor October for me and um, I thought I'd read the first poem that's called My Last Duchess and other poems so I thought I'd read that I'm watching all these bikers and joggers go by people walking their dogs and stuff um, I thought I'd read that and then do a quick review of uh, the a Victorian book that I just happened to finish on the 1st of October um, so Robert Browning, I think I knew about him as a child because probably my dad read us the Pied Piper of Hamelin because he used to sometimes read poetry to us. So I think I vaguely knew about him then. But the, the next time I really encountered Robert Browning it was kind of comical. The, um, I was a freshman in college and the school that I went to had a, a big international um, group of students that came to study business and English and I was friends with some of them and they came to me and asked for help they were both um, fr a native French speakers so one was from France itself and the other was from the island of Guadalupe in the Caribbean and they were um, studying English and they had been put into a higher level and they got assigned a poem by Robert Browning that they had to read and do a, a report on. And they could not understand what it was about at all. They just couldn't understand it. So they came to me and asked me for help. And I sat down trying to read it. And I didn't know. I was like 18 or 19. I, I couldn't figure out what it was about at first either. And I just kept reading it and trying to figure it out for them. And suddenly it dawned on me what it was about. And so, um, and I, I really liked it because it's sort of like the, you know, the sun broke through the clouds and I, suddenly I got the meaning of it. And it's kind of uh, eerie, so I think it's appropriate for October. Um, but, and you're probably familiar with it anyway, but it's My Last Duchess. And I read it to my husband yesterday and he actually looked up information about it. And apparently it says My Last Duchess and then Ferrara. And apparently that was this a family in Italy that was very, very prestigious and um, powerful. And um, this really is kind of based on a true story, and then this legend came out of it. But this Duke of Ferrara had this um, really prestigious family, powerful family, and he was arranging to have a second marriage with um it turns out was somebody of the de medici family which of course became very famous but this was just as they were rising and he was uh contracting a marriage into that family so anyway so here we go and let's see if i can read it very well because it is kind of a hard poem to read it really is robert browning is very kind of choppy and he's sort of very condensed So let me try. All right. My last duchess, Ferrara. That's my last duchess painted on the wall, looking as if she were alive. I call that piece a wonder now. Fra Pandolf's hands worked busily a day, and there she stands. Wilt please you sit and look at her? I said Fra Pandolf by design, for never read strangers like you that pictured countenance, the depth and passion of its earnest glance, but to myself they turned, since none puts by the curtain I have drawn for you but I, and seemed as they would ask me if they durst, how such a glance came there so, not the first are you to turn and ask thus, search was not her husband's presence only, called that spot of joy into the duchess cheek perhaps fra pandolf chanced to say her mantle laps over my lady's wrist too much or paint must never hope to reproduce the faint half flush that dies along her throat such stuff was courtesy she thought and cause enough for calling up that spot of joy she had a heart how shall i say too soon made glad too easily impressed. She liked whate'er she looked on, and her looks went everywhere. Sir, twas all one. 
my favor at her breast, the dropping of the daylight in the west, the bough of cherries some officious fool broke in the orchard for her, the white mule she rode with round the terrace, all and each would draw from her alike the approving speech, or blush at least. She thanked men good, but thanked somehow, I know not how, as if she ranked my gift of a nine hundred years old name with anybody's gift. Who'd stoop to blame this sort of trifling? Even had you skill in speech, which I have not, to make your will quite clear to such a one, and say, Just this or that in you disgusts me. Here you miss, or there exceed the mark. And if she let herself be lessened so, nor plainly set her wits to yours forsooth and made excuse, even then there would be some stooping, and I choose never to stoop. Oh, sir, she smiled, no doubt, when e'er I passed her, but who passed without much the same smile? This grew, I gave commands. Then all smiles stopped together. There she stands, as if alive. Will it please you rise? We'll meet the company below, then. I repeat, the Count, your master's known munificence, is ample warrant that no just pretense of mine for dowry will be disallowed. Though his fair daughter's self, as I avowed, at starting is my object, nay, we'll go together down, sir. Notice Neptune, though, taming a seahorse, thought a rarity, which Klaus of Innsbruck cast in bronze for me. So, I mean, it's hard to get it, I think, on the first reading, but basically this guy is showing a portrait of his last duchess, his wife, who... He didn't like the fact that she was nice to everybody and smiled <laughs> at everyone. And he's, he's weirdly paranoid. Like, like the guy doesn't even say anything about the spot of joy in her cheek. But he says, well, if you dared, you would be asking me that question. Why she looked like that? Well, she looks like that because she smiled at everybody and it really bothered me. And so he has her killed. And then you find out that he's about to contract a marriage with some other woman. So it was really chilling. And he's just confessed to murdering his first wife. Eey. So anyway, uh, so I don't know if I did that justice at all, but it was a good, it's a good poem. I like Robert Browning because he tells these really pithy, intense, strange stories. There goes a jogger. There you go. People are just up and out so early in the morning. I had to do this because the uh, the five-year-old, who was turning six this week, got up at quarter of seven. I was like, I don't have any privacy. Anyway, so that's Robert Browning, and I'm enjoying learning about him. And the book that I finished is um, In the Roar of the Sea. Oh, my gosh. I was going to get the name straight because the last time I talked about it, I totally but butchered his name. So let me see if I can find him. So I can say the... Uh, okay, yeah. Sabine Baring Gould. So that's B-A-R-I-N-G dash G-O-U-L-D. And he wrote this book, In the Roar of the Sea. And I talked about him last time that he was um, extremely prolific. He was this clergyman. He wrote the hymn, Onward, Christian Soldiers. Um, and it's a it's a really fun melodramatic book uh, about this uh, girl, Judith, who you really relate to. You really feel her predicament. She's, she's, she wants to do what's right, and she's trying to stand up against overwhelming forces. She's defenseless, um, and she's, you know, she's trying by her wits and her sense of what's right and wrong to withstand all this temptation and this um pressure um and and it so it's you know you f you really feel for her uh and it's set on the shore of uh, or on the coast of of um Cornwall and it's all about smugglers and shipwrecks and um uh, there's all these different characters in the town where she lives a very isolated area and uh, it was quite enjoyable. I really liked it a lot. The author was very coy at the end. And he doesn't quite end it. Which was amusing. I kind of like that about a lot of Victorian novels. Because I'm also reading this. 
Can You Forgive Her by Anthony Trollope. And there's always this sort of tongue-in-cheek, um, you know, reference where the author kind of breaks in and says, well, I personally think this. Or they'll, they'll put some sort of, um, you know, the author interjects, kind of breaks the fourth wall. And I really think that's so clever of them because they really create a full world. But they... Um, but at the same time, they can very kind of gracefully interject um, themselves into the book. So I really, I really uh, appreciate that that deftness that they had, uh, which maybe we don't have that so much anymore. When people write, they seem very, very serious about their world building, and they would never do something like that. Um, I say there's something a little bit lighter about it or where they don't take themselves quite so seriously, perhaps. Um, so, so I highly recommend, um, in the roar of the sea that it was a, it was really exciting. There were these, uh, fun plot twists. You were always wondering what was going to happen next. Um, yeah, it was, it was a good book and I'd like to read more by that same author, Sabine Baring Gould. So that, and I was happy to finish that right at the, there's all these people going by. Um, I was happy to finish that on the first day of October. I felt like I had a good uh, first day of October. Um, so th so that was, that's in the roar of the sea. What time is it? I don't want to make this too long since I read that poem as well. But anyway, I am reading this and I'm enjoying it. I'm up to page 165. Uh, this is quite different in, oh my gosh, there's a whole group of bikers. This is quite different. You can tell I'm ADD. <laughs> anyway, this is quite different in tone. Anthony Trollope is so good at nuance and relationships and people's interior thoughts and how they're trying to cope with, you know, everyday um, relationships, usually having to do with marriage or courtship. Um and people struggling with that, or sometimes it's about their career, issues that come up in their career um, that they're trying to grapple with. And you get to, and and you can see them making mistakes. You can see how their mis their thinking is mistaken, and they're they're um, getting themselves into a corner, or it's not going to go well. I can't say. So so Anthony Trollop also wrote the Barchester series, The Warden, Barchester Towers, etc. That whole series is six books and all. And I enjoyed that series so much. The characters are likable. In every book, there's somebody you can really like. So far, the main characters are kind of annoying. I don't feel that connection to them. There's Alice Vavasar, and she's She's just so ambivalent. She's equivocating between two men. She was sort of almost engaged to her cousin, George, who did something that made her break off the engagement. I don't know if he cheated on her somehow, but this is like Victorian. So did he really cheat on her? Or I don't know what happened. But, I mean, they don't say. But just he did something that broke her trust and she broke off the... And they weren't quite formally engaged, but everybody was expecting it. And they were in love. Um, and then he did whatever he did. He's kind of Byronic. You know, he's kind of a moody guy. He's got ambitions. And he's sort of maybe not ready to settle down. But he falls in love. Um, and then, so then she becomes engaged to another guy, John Gray. John Gray is handsome. He's very, a lot of confidence. He's very intelligent. He's in love with her. He fell in love with her. But he's very quiet. He lives out in the country in a quiet area. He's not interested in London life or whatever. And Alice, she sort of likes the idea. So, so George has run for parliament. He lost, but he's going to run again. She likes the whole idea of being a politician's wife. She likes that excitement. And she's afraid to marry John Gray because she feels like it's going to be too quiet a life, even though she loves him and admires him and thinks he knows he's a good man. He's better than George, but she's still attracted to George because she's a little bit, she likes excitement and she wants, you know, she wants life to be interesting. So she's ambivalent. So she breaks it off with John Gray. So now what's going to happen? She's just going back and forth between these two men. And then 
There's another woman who's really funny, Mrs. Greenow, and she's this rich widow, and she just loves having the power that she's got, to, and she's very attractive. She's a young widow. She loves having the, having the power she has to just sort of flirt and sort of manipulate everything, and she's determined to uh, be a matchmaker for her um, niece, Kate. So, uh, so that's kind of a funny situation. I guess I like Mrs. Green Owl the best. Kate is kind of annoying herself too. She's George's sister. Um, and then I haven't even met the one that I think is the, the woman who goes on into further books in the series, which is, cause I've heard about her, Lady Glencora, Miss, uh, McCluskey, who becomes the wife to Plantagenet Palliser. And E. Plantagenet even shows up uh, just for like a cameo in the Barchester books. I forget which one. Maybe Doctor, not Doctor Thorne, Framley Parsonage. Maybe he shows up. Um, but uh, yeah, we haven't. I haven't even met her yet. And I'm on page one sixty five. It's all been about Alice and George and Kate. So and Mrs. Greenow. So anyway. So I am enjoying it though, but it's quite different. It's a, it's more, you know, it's not like romantic in the sense that this is Lorna Dune. I started Lorna Dune. I love it. It's, it's like a fairy tale almost. Um, the, uh, the descriptions of the countryside, you feel like you're way back in time. Uh, in this very sort of bucolic, but it's not really bucolic because the dunes, I didn't know anything about the story, okay? Just very, very vaguely. The dunes are this noble family in the area. Um, and this is also, I think, set in either Devon or Cornwall. So it's very similar in mood to In the Roar of the Sea, which is interesting that I'm reading books of this type. Um, but the Dunes are actually like, they're almost like a mafiosa type family that dominates this area. And, um, it's written in the, in the form of a memoir. So John Ridd is an old man writing about his life and it starts when he's 12. Um, and it's just, the language is pretty archaic and there's a lot of dialect and while that makes it harder to read, it really like creates this ambiance. So I'm just, I just love. I'm 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 only read four chapters, but I am really really enjoying this one. So and it's really a clash. I'll read this and it'll I'll be like in this whole other romantic, you know, old fashioned world. And then when I read this, it's much more modern in feel. You know, it's about complicated people doing complicated things. And I think it's going to be a lot more about politics because George is uh, running for parliament or he's about to run for parliament. So we're going to learn all about his campaign and everything. And Anthony Trollope was, I mean, he was interested in relationships. He talks a lot about that, but he also was very interested in uh, politics because he really, I think he was a real reformer. And so he gets very satirical and uh, very... Um, you know, uh, critical of a lot of things going on in, in the government at the time. So yeah, so that's it. And then, um, oh my gosh, 18. And then I did start Diary of a Nobody, which is a comical book and it's in the form of a diary and it's, it's just kind of silly. And I really like it because the guy's like, oh, I'm an ordinary guy. I'll keep a diary. And he's just talking about all the everyday mishaps he has with tradesmen, like, you know, the guy who gives him eggs, gives him rotten eggs. And there's a scraper, a mud scraper in the front, in his, the front of the house that he's rented that people keep tripping on. Um, and just kind of silly stuff. But I like all the homey detail about what life must have been like at that time. So that's nice. I, I love, I'm loving all the detail. I mean, this one doesn't give as much detail because it's all about servants and everything. But, um... This one gives a lot of detail, and The Diary of a Nobody gives a lot of detail just about everyday life, like just how things were done. So, all right, well, I've hit my 19 minutes, so I guess my time's up. So, happy Victober. I hope you're doing well, and happy reading. Bye.